Thank you. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to tell you about uh, our research into spreading processes. Uh, a brief outline of my talk. So I'll first uh, motivate the study of epidemic spreadings. And given the last three years, I think that this is going to be easy. Um, I'll then uh, talk about inferring specific states in uh, spreading dynamics and optimizing the use of budget. So budget can be vaccination, for instance, or uh, information or marketing tools, uh, how to use best the, to best use them in order to optimize the, uh, the final result. Then I'll move on to competitive and comparative uh, and, and collaborative spreading. In competitive spreading, there are two uh, different spreading processes in parallel, and they are mutually exclusive. In collaborative ones, one can assist the other. So the first one can, uh, can correspond to, uh, for example, um, opinion setting, uh, Republicans versus Democrats or something like that, two parallel processes of convincing people. And the other one, a collaborative process can be HIV and tuberculosis. The spread of one disease is assisted by, by the other. And then there is a question of how to mitigate the spread of collaborative processes by addressing one of them, vaccinating, for instance, against one of them, and by that stopping the other as well. Uh, the final uh, piece of work that I'm going to talk about is about pre-symptomatic but uh, uh, infective states, which is actually the, uh, the situation in COVID. So you can be pre-symptomatic but still infective. So the question is how effective are containment and mitigation measures in such a situation? And this corresponds to the, uh, to the three uh, papers that are listed below. So what do we want to know about uh, epidemic spreading? So macroscopically, it's, it's quite easy. We want to know what is the fraction of the population that is ill. Uh, we want to know whether the disease will die out or, or get out of control. What would be an effective vaccination strategy and how effective are uh, mitigation measures that we can take? But moreover, microscopically, we may want to infer exactly who is most at risk. And uh, what should we, um, who should we vaccinate in order to mitigate the spread further on after 100 days or something like that? Uh, and then how to best use the vaccination budget in order to get the best outcome of, of the allowed budget. And finally, we can talk about identifying patient zero, which is also has a, a, a value in identifying the uh, development of the disease. So motivating um, um, epidemic spreading studies is quite easy. 6.6 .6 million deaths and uh, $10 trillion foregone in GDP in the last, in, only in 2020 uh, uh, and 2021 is a good enough uh, reason. However, if we compare it to other diseases that we have had in the past, COVID is actually a relatively light one, 6.6 .6 million deaths in comparison to 17 to 100 million deaths in the Spanish flu and up to 200 million in the Black Death. So we definitely, it's a good idea to uh, be prepared. But not only that, epidemic spreading is not only about diseases. For instance, uh, in, in the US, there were a um, power outage of, uh, that, costed, uh, that, that caused 2.5 million people to be left in the dark. Uh, in 2010, uh, 2011. And this works very much like an epidemic spreading because uh, each power plant that uh, cannot supply the goods will simply uh, collapse and pass on the, uh, the request to another one, which will then be overloaded and will um, um, collapse as well. Similarly, the US economy suffered, suffered significant losses in the crash of 2008, which operates in a similar way. Uh, when uh, institutes fail, they actually pass on the, the debt to others. Um, and social networks. So social network is excellent if you want to uh, collect donations by spreading the word uh, over social networks, but it also was very useful, is very useful in getting people elected and getting decisions passed. For instance, there is a very detailed study about the 2012 presidential elections uh, showing how Obama made much better use of social networks uh, than Mitt Romney and therefore won the elections. And uh, unfortunately, there is a catalog of uh, successful or less successful uh, 
referenda and, and the presidential elections that are, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of books about them as well. So the question is, how do we model uh, um, epidemic spreading? So um, one of the most popular models is called the SIR model, in which we have each one of the nodes can be in one of three states, uh, susceptible, infected, or recovered. So, and there is some probability, uh, for instance, uh, alpha IJ, that if your neighbor is infected, you have a probability of being infected as well. So these probabilities, alpha probability of uh, uh, infected um, spontaneously while being um, uh, susceptible and the probability of recovery, all of these are the main um, variables that we are going to use in our model. So one of the nodes becomes infected with probably new JT. Uh, it infects another node with some probability alpha IJ and the other one alpha IK, and then one of them becomes uh, recovered and so on. Okay, so what do we do with this information? How do we analyze uh, spreading processes? So the first, the most easy one is to do simulations. Simulations are great. They are very flexible. You can accommodate very complicated rules, the age of people, the socioeconomic background, um, their susceptibility, whatever. You can do whatever you want. The only problem is that they are very volatile and large networks will require a computational uh, power that is ever increasing uh, in order to get reliable results. Other ways of modeling um, um, epidemic spreading is by doing continuous dynamics. So this requires a, an assumption that um, all of the states are more or less uniform. So we are um, um, we, we can monitor the probability the development of the fraction of the population that is susceptible or infected or recovered by their condition on the others according to the probabilities. Um, the, uh, on, on all of the other uh, variables. We need only two because the three of them are, should be the, the full population. So it's uniform dynamics. It ignores completely the network of contacts between individuals, but it's easy to analyze. Another popular, popular approach is that of a, a network that is based on degree distribution. So we can assume a certain degree distribution, the number of connections per node, and we sample at random from this distribution, and we can monitor the percolation of this process. That means whether it, is, it remains local or spreads all over the network. It is very complicated for contact networks. So these are networks that takes time also into account because um, at a certain point you get on the bus and you meet someone and then you get off the bus and this link is, is disconnected. So these are called contact networks. And also it ignores completely the actual architecture. Two networks with the same degree distribution can be completely different. And also it does not allow you to look at individuals, the states of individuals. The approach that I'm advocating is, comes from the family of message passing approaches. Uh, it is probabilistic, it is principled, it gives both the statistics and the dynamics of individuals and, and, and a full model. It allows uh, for making specific decisions about individuals and it's comp computationally efficient because it relies on the assumption that the only people who are interacting with you are your nearest neighbors, the ones that are connected to you on the graph. Where does it fail? So it is exact on trees and represents an approximation on loopy networks, although in most locally tree-like networks, they are pretty accurate because the loops are pretty long. So the feedback is very, very uh, suppressed. The second thing is it, is it is exact. The one that I'm going to tell you about is exact only for unidirectional processes. So you cannot model um, a reinfection. So you can only go through a susceptible, infected, recovered, for instance, but you cannot be uh, infected again. So I'll give you a crash course on message passing techniques. Um, and the idea is very simple. Uh, in physics terms, so we have a set of variables, sigma one to sigma n, each one of them can take one of the, in this case, three states. 
and we look at the whole probability of all of them jointly. We can write it in the form of a, a Boltzmann weight with a Hamiltonian that represents the problem. As an example, I'm going to give a hard computational problem of a graph coloring. So in graph coloring, different nodes are uh, uh, related through edges. And um, if two nodes that share an edge have the same color, you should be penalized. So the uh, cost is increasing. And if they are not, then you are OK. You're fine. Uh, the ground state of this system gives us the inferred values for the probability of each one of the variables to be in a certain state. So uh, naively, what we would like to do is uh, what is called maximum posteriori. Maximum posteriori simply looks through all of the possible configurations, which can be three to the power of n, of, obviously it's unfeasible, and choose the one with the highest probability. Alternatively, we can say, let's marginalize. That means take a sum over all of the possible states, except for, for variable sigma i, and then make a decision about sigma i. This is pretty simple because it's only one variable. The downside, of course, is that you have to sum over n minus one variables in order to get there. However, on, on, tr on trees, sparsely connected trees, where you have all the one neighbors, this becomes a bit easier because you don't actually have to sum over all the variables, only on the variables that are nearest to you. This is, the, this is exact on trees, but uh, um, uh, uh, approximate on tree-like structures. Um, OK, so what, what do we do then? The neighbors, it's fine if we look at the neighbors, but they are connected to other neighbors. And they are connected to other neighbors. So instead of uh, making it a one-go calculation, we have to do it inter iteratively. We pass on messages. Each one of the variables is telling the other variables what its state is. And you, we do that by mapping the problem onto what is called a bipartite factor graph. So all of these are the variables. And these are factors that represent the edges between them. And the factors simply try to make sure that uh, sigma 1 and sigma 2 do not have the same color. So it's a kind of a restriction that is imposed by the factors. And the way to do that is by passing iteratively conditional messages, condi messages that are conditional probabilities of this form between variables and factors and vice versa. And the whole process converges for sure on trees and um, most likely on tree-like structures. Um, OK, so the, this is message passing in general. We are looking at a more challenging situation because in, dynamic, in dynamical processes, the whole time window, the whole trajectory, passes messages to the other trajectories. So this becomes more complicated. However, uh, Andre Locke of my collaborator and his collaborators came up with quite a, a, an interesting idea. And there are some um, competing uh, methods listed below. And this says, because it's a unidirectional process, the only thing that we have to know is what are the times in which susceptible becomes infected and infected becomes uh, uh, recovered. These are the two times that we need to know. That's it. So. Um, and from that, we can calculate all of the probabilities about different trajectories infecting one another and so on. So the dynamics is irreversible because this constitutes the, the reliance on, on the two times, and it is exact on trees. And at the end of the day, what we want to know is to calculate the probability of a node being uh, infected, susceptible, recovered, whatever. The algorithmic complexity is fairly modest. It's just the number of edges multiplied by the time window. OK, so then what do we get? So we get this list of equations connecting messages to um, uh, uh, marginal probabilities. But this is too complex, so forget it. Um, just in order to show you that it actually works, so uh, uh, Andre took um, the 61 major uh, US airports connected by 383 edges. 
and the probabilities, infection probabilities between them as if, uh, are determined through the number of passengers on these lines. And he compared the results obtained by a dynamical message passing to those obtained by Monte Carlo simulations. And, and as you can see, the agreement is pretty convincing. Okay. So that is only the setup in order to monitor the epidemic spreading. But then we want to optimize it. And not only that, we want to optimize it at the end point. We don't want to optimize this, for instance, the vaccination today. We want that in 10 days time, we will be able to minimize the number of people infected. And this is the challenge. So what, are, what do people do? So there are a lot of methods. Um, most people rely on simulations, but again, they are volatile and computationally very difficult. Then there are um, naive approaches that are based on assigning, uh, say, a vaccination or a contribution to the highest degree nodes, because they are the ones that are propagating the most, they are connected to uh, um, quite a lot of other nodes, which makes sense, but it's not a principled approach and doesn't always work between the centrality, random walk centralities, casual decomposition, network decomposition, all of these are methods that are coming from a graph theory, from complex network theory, and, and they are successful sometimes, sometimes not. What we want to do is to have a principled end of process optimization based on um, our um, dynamical message passing approach. So the way to do that, is um, very similar to what is called optimal control. So we are trying to, we, we look at the whole dynamics as a, as a set of constraints on the variables from time zero to time T, capital T, but the objective is only measured at time T. So the objective can be maximizing the number of people infected if it's marketing or minimizing the number of people infected if it's epidemic spreading. Um, and we uh, represent the constraints, constraints on budget, like we may have a, a, a certain amount of vaccination per day, or uh, the whole budget comes at, at time zero. Um, and so we have the objective, the budget, the parameters, which are probabilities, so they should be between zero and one, initial conditions, and the dynamics itself. So putting all of that together would mean that we have an objective and Lagrange multipliers that are responsible for all of the constraints. So obtaining a solution is by using these Lagrange multipliers. So at the top of this plot, we simply use dynamic message passing in order to calculate the probabilities of uh, each one of the variables in time up to value t. And then the results at value t can be derived back using optimal control in order to calculate the corresponding values of the Lagrange multipliers. Then the Lagrange multipliers are put back in place and we repeat the process until it converges. So at the end of the day, what we have is a way over time to, um, um, to um, um, invest the budget in a best possible way in order to get the end objective. Oops, wrong button. Um, so this is an example, a small example. So this is uh, 19 uh, nodes that represent the 9-11 the, uh, um, um, uh, network of, of terrorists. And the task is to uh, spread the budget that we have, which is 0.1n, so 1.9 at each point in time, in such a way that we will definitely infect all the big uh, uh, spheres uh, at each one of the time steps. So our task is to infect these two sphere at time two, these two at time four, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the darker the color, the higher the probability that this node has been infected by our method. So as you can see, we were quite successful in managing with the budget to infect all of the, of, of the nodes in the right time. So this is a time sensitive kind of infection. Uh, just in order to get a convincing small example, 
we took this benchmark example of the Slovene uh, parliamentary political parties. So all of these are political parties and the thicker the line between them means that they are more influential. So how to spread your influence as much as possible in this setting. And the three red spheres, uh, circles are the ones that the only ones that we have control over. So we took a budget of 1.5, and the question is how to separate them between these three groups in such a way that will maximize the spread of influence after a certain number of uh, time steps. In this case, I think we waited for saturation or something like that. Okay. So uh, because it's three elements that should sum to 1.5, it's only two degrees of freedom which give rise to this plot. And as you can see, the DMP solution uh, coincides with the best value, the highest value of the objective function. Uh, we also ran a large scale um, uh, benchmark uh, examples in order to um, convince ourselves that DMP is doing much better than other methods. And indeed in most of the in most of the cases, it was uh, it came first in terms of performance. Uh, interestingly, high degree assignment of, of uh, budget to the highest degree node came up quite high, highly as well. And the reason was very simple. When we looked at the networks where it was so successful, there were networks with a very high, uh, very very dominant hubs. So in a dominant hub, there is not much you can do beyond giving uh, the um, highest degree node uh, most, of the, uh, most of the resource. Okay, the last example before I move on is about mitigating an epidemic spreading. So in this case, again, it's a fictitious uh, scenario whereby we put, we infected a node in Atlanta. These are again the 61 uh, US airports with 383 edges and we infected the Atlanta airport, because it's a major hub. And what we had is a budget of 0.05 N. So if N is 61, so it's about, I don't know, um, uh, three um, elements per, per, per time step that we could vaccinate. So each time we deployed our vaccination team on one of these airports, and we tried to minimize the spread after 10 days. And we looked at the following possibilities. The first one is DMP planned. So we take the time horizon to be 10, we plan everything in advance and we follow suit. The next one is greedy, which means we looked at each time step at the node with the highest risk. The third uh, um, uh, method is DMP greedy. So we apply DMP, but only to the next time step. And the last one, which proved to be the best is you plan everything to the time horizon T. But in, with each time step, you have more information about who was infected, who was not infected, and you update your, uh, your strategy, which makes sense. Um, and as one can see, uh, the DMP optimal resulted in a much, much lower uh, number of infections after 10 days. What is also interesting is the choice of airports. So um, the um, green squares, represent the airports that were chosen one step at a time by the greedy mechanism, greedy DMP, and optimal DMP chose completely different ones. So it anticipated in advance uh, what will impact on the, um, on, on the spread of the disease. Okay, now I move to the next part of my talk. And that is about collaborative and cooperative processes. So in competitive processes, you have multiple processes. They are states are mutually exclusive. You, get, you want to get there first in order to block your opponent. If you manage to surround your opponent like in Go, then they have nowhere to go. Um, in collaborative processes, you have multiple processes that um, support one another. Like the example that um, Yamir Moreno gave uh, on Monday of HIV and tuberculosis. Or you can give similar, um, um, similar um, examples with different illnesses that actually support one another. You increase the, the, the spread of the disease if you are already infected by one. Um, alternatively, you, don't, you expect that Trump supporters are less likely to believe in climate change. 
So this is again how to spread um, 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 information in, a, in, a, in nodes that are um, working collaboratively. Okay, so this now is becoming a bit more complicated. And we did this only for the SI uh, com co competitive or col collaborative processes. So we have nodes that are susceptible or in process A, undergo process A or process B, and they have different times of uh, different probabilities of infection. Uh, the competitive case is difficult, but it's not so difficult because at the end of the day, you have to decide whether it uh, transforms from S to IA or from S to IB, and that's the end of the game. In collaborative processes, this is much more complex because it can move from between S to IA or to IB, and then from IA to IB or from IB to IA, and each one of them may have different probabilities. So there is a very careful set of uh, plots in order to describe the different order of infections and how they uh, impact on the development of the, of the system. And this is a bit more uh, complex. So a couple of uh, examples. So the first one is on what is called the football net, uh, another benchmark method of the um, college football um, inter uh, matches in the US with 150 nodes. And in this case, we put two processes, PA and PB, 